is an umbrella term that describes a, a broad set of uh, symptoms brought on by altitude. Half of the individuals that move to altitude are susceptible to some degree, and there's a wide variety of symptoms that generally indicate take your time, slow down, see if they subside. If they don't, then do something to fix it. But it's difficult to say that this is due to altitude because a lot of the symptoms parallel some other uh, issues like carbon monoxide poisoning or, or dehydration, for instance. So acute mountain sickness, general malaise and issues brought on by being at altitude, exacerbated by being dehydrated or, or anemic, that uh, severely limit your functional ability at altitude and might end you up in the hospital like, uh, like Katie. Now, if these symptoms persist or get worse, um, they often culminate in two major ways that can be, uh, can be fatal if left untreated. And the first is cerebral edema. So the headaches that persist with acute mountain sickness are usually from pressure shifts or pressure changes due to fluid shifts. And if that fluid continues to shift, into the brain specifically, um, cells in the brain will swell, and much like hyponatremia, there's little area for the brain to expand into, and so that swelling can run up quickly against the inside of the skull, in which case damage can ensue and, and death can occur if um, the swelling is severe enough. So this is often something that happens at altitude just because of different uh, changes in pressure, it um, presents as confusion. You have the, the headache, confusion, and there's loss of mental function and coordination. So decision-making is impaired as well, which is usually quite bad when you're on the side of a mountain and you're faced with continuing up uh, and achieving your goal or returning back down to the safety of lower altitudes and higher PO2s. But... Um, Something to be considered because this is a potentially fatal endpoint of altitude mountain sickness if the cerebral edema continues. It's often observed, but we don't have a concrete mechanism for it. We don't know for sure what causes the swelling. Pressure changes is, uh, is a possibility due to vasoconstriction at altitude or potentially also due to the cold at the summits of some mountains. But one theory is that um, mean cerebral artery velocity is an attempt to compensate for lower O2 delivery to the brain. The brain always needs a fresh supply of oxygen and glucose. And if oxygen is lacking, Central chemoreceptors will sense that and in severe cases might modify blood flow locally to correct the low PO2. So the brain senses low O2 and it might increase blood velocity so that the delivery, the total delivery of oxygen is restored. Not just the saturation, which is a percent, it's not a concentration measure, but percent delivered faster means the total net delivery of oxygen goes up. So this is one way that we can compensate for the low PO2 at altitude. The downside is that increase in velocity <coughs> increases pressure in the arteries, forces fluid out, and causes the resulting swelling. So more oxygen delivery potentially negative side effects of increased swelling. And there's probably some gray area where there's, there's a transition where this is a good response, but certainly in the extreme, you can imagine this is detrimental. Another option is the blood-brain barrier is thought to, to maybe change permeability. Generally, the cells of the blood-brain barrier are connected by very tight junctions. The names are tight junctions because they don't allow anything through, which normally protects the brain from 
some drugs and substances that shouldn't be bathed in, but the low PO2 may somehow affect permeability, which allows more fluid to shift out. That's another theory. Really difficult to make that measurement in practice. But we're not exactly sure why this happens. We are sure that it happens, and in severe cases, it needs to be treated or rectified. Similar effects can be seen in other tissues, and the other critical tissue where this swelling occurs is in the lungs. Um, related to pressure changes as well because of vasoconstriction due to low PO2, here, when fluid accumulates, you don't have the issue of cells swelling and being impeded, eventually bursting or being damaged. Here, swelling or the, the, the movement of fluid causes edema in the lungs and reduces um, oxygen transfer. So the alveoli, normally very thin, have some light fluid lining them, allows gases to move across easily. But when fluid pools in the alveoli, efficient gas exchange is limited, oxygen can't move in, and PO2 drops even further. And this is often indicated by um, the individual trying to expectorate, to expel the fluid in the lungs. It's a heavy cough or a wheeze that you'll hear at altitude, especially with prolonged time sitting at altitude. And a lot of people will mistake that for a cold or pneumonia. Um, just like there's no smoker's cough, it's not necessary that cold persists or, or pneumonia persists at altitude. It could be the collection of fluid in the lungs preventing gas exchange. So here again, vasoconstriction is at play. We think that what happens is the reflex vasoconstriction due to a lower PO2 in the lungs again pushes fluid out, very similar mechanism to what's proposed for the cerebral edema. The tissue is what's different here. And while low PO2 can cause that vasoconstriction to push fluid out through an increase in pressure, it's also possible, since we have an inroad for cold air into the lungs, that the cold reflex adds to that vasoconstrictive response. Remember cold specifically, there's a local reflex where it vasoconstricts the arterioles. We looked at norepinephrine being released from the, the neurons, vasoconstriction occurring with prolonged vasoconstriction in the cold. There's uh, ROS production. It might lessen. That local reflex could also be in play in the lungs due to the inhalation of uh, cold, dry air at altitude. So that's um, a secondary or an additive effect. Vasoconstriction due to low PO2, reflex vasoconstriction due to cold, both increasing pressure, driving fluid into the interstitial space uh, and pushing it towards the, uh, the alveoli into the lungs proper and limiting oxygen transfer. There are some ways that you can assess this, and, and normal blood pressure response, if it's high, can be used as a diagnostic tool. So individuals with high blood pressure generally not advised to go to altitude for prolonged periods of time, because they seem to be particularly at risk for developing these cold-like symptoms and um, having issues with respiration at altitude. So these are our physical consequences of altitude. And usually, acclimatization can, for the most part, help you deal with these. But it's also worth uh, acknowledging some of the mental constraints with altitude as well, the cognitive deficits that might occur, maybe as a result of cerebral edema and confusion and dizziness but also the drive and the passion to achieve your goal results in what is uh, lovingly referred to as summit fever, which you can think of as a, an irrational illness. It's not 
a classic illness in the sense that there's a cause and effect and you can pinpoint the disease. This is due, it's a psychological um, effect that's usually self-imposed by the individual. There's this drive to climb a mountain. There's an irrational goal to pursue it at all costs. You've invested a lot of time and money, and if you're really close to the summit, you can't turn back and fail. And at that point, your decision-making process, which is already compromised, tilts, quote, unquote, in favor of success over feelings of safety. So your decision-making process that maybe it's impacted by some um, pressure change in the brain or some small degree of edema, it's already compromised, and now you've got this added irrational layer on top that says you can't fail, you must succeed, and it doesn't matter if it's somewhat dangerous because you're so close. And it's this, uh, it's this line of thinking that probably um, limits our understanding of the physical consequences of altitude. We have some idea, we have some um, guesses of what might cause cerebral edema and pulmonary edema, but measuring them is really difficult because people in those situations won't often report symptoms accurately. These individuals might be deceptive because they think if, um, if you're being honest and reporting your symptoms honestly, maybe someone, the doctor, whoever is going to force you to go back down. You won't achieve your goal. That's an irrational fear. Really, the people that are there to help you are, are there to, do, um, to help you achieve your goal safely. But the deceptive symptoms, uh, the deceptive reporting of symptoms might impact the ability to fully understand and characterize the disease. So that's why on expeditions, we've seen some of the, um, uh, the footage from the original successful Everest expedition. There's, there's a command structure with someone in charge, and the hierarchy is explicit. It's almost military-like in its application, which is meant to um, remove some of the guesswork and decision-making, but also to... Um, to temper some of the excitement, to temper some of the individual um, personalities and motivations and help to, to achieve the goal safely. And uh, as one of the first, this Ed Viesters is one of the first uh, individuals to climb eight, well, 14 8,000 meter peaks without oxygen, 8,000 meters being uh, 24,000 feet. Getting up is optional, getting down is mandatory. So even achieving your goal and reaching the summit and you think everything's over and then there's no issues with safety, you're only halfway through the expedition. Getting down is mandatory. So what can you do in a situation where you're at altitude for prolonged periods of time, you're at a high altitude that significantly stresses the body, Maybe you have some symptoms coming on, dizziness, headache, nausea. Maybe you're motivated to go up, but something says um, correct the situation. What countermeasures are there that you can employ to at least on the short term alleviate the symptoms? In a preventative sense, fitness, acclimatization, are the two-pronged approach to ensure success at altitude. Um, acclimation to low O2, so spending time um, in the foothills of the Himalayas, as we saw during the expedition, spending time at base camp to acclimate to the surroundings. Having a high fitness, high hemoglobin content, and high carrying capacity all at the onset increase the likelihood of success. Those are things that you can't change after the fact, necessarily. So planning ahead and adding these in will ensure your success at altitude. Things that you can change after the fact are reinstituting a higher PO2. That's the stress. That causes the problems. And the reflex to that stress is what initiates symptoms of edema, and acute mountain sickness. So reinstituting a higher PO2 removes that stress. 
What does that mean? Going down. Returning to, uh, to lower altitudes. Probably by far the, the easiest but maybe least desirable um, countermeasure is to return to lower altitudes. I'm just realizing I don't have supplemental oxygen on here. That must be on here. No, it's not. Well, okay, supplemental oxygen, also corrective. Reinstituting a, a higher PO2 by delivering more oxygen is a way to correct these symptoms at altitude. There's a, we're, we're going to talk at, at length about the different kinds of supplemental oxygen at the end of this section, but that's absolutely a corrective element to include. Probably one of the best at the top of the list, other than returning back to low altitudes. Um... Not correcting, not returning to low altitudes, all of a sudden puts everyone else at risk. People that are working near their limits must mobilize and self, or not self-rescue, but mobilize and rescue any individuals that succumb to uh, symptoms at altitude. Stopping exercise, limiting the climb, not lowering PO2 further. If you're not going back to lower altitudes, at least stop and take a rest at the same altitude. Limit exercise, limit the demand for O2, and stop the ascent. The old climber's adage <clears throat> is never go up until symptoms go down. Getting down is mandatory, absolutely, but never go up until symptoms go down. So if you have a headache, stop, rest, pause. There are... Um, a few drugs that have been uh, thought to help uh, at altitude, but few of them are physiologically relevant. One of them is uh, acetazolamide that blocks carbonic anhydrase, which um, you know is the enzyme that buffers CO2 in the blood. That's the near equilibrium enzyme. And when you make CO2, it ends up... Um, making bicarbonate, producing protons, making the blood somewhat more acidic, and, uh, and bicarbonate to help buffer uh, the increase in CO2. And so the idea behind some of these classes of drugs, these altitude sickness drugs, is that acetazolamide will block that enzyme. And what that means is that you have an accumulation of CO2 that is registered by the chemoreceptors in the brain and stimulates ventilation. The idea here being that if ventilation is stimulated, not only do you blow off excess CO2, but you also end up loading more O2 into the blood, hyperventilating to, uh, to load more oxygen and hopefully stave off the effects of altitude. Side effect is that your body becomes more acidic because you don't have that um, buffer enzyme active in the body. Not generally advised, but it's one method of um, pharmacologically countering the symptoms of altitude. The second, which is really popular in South America, is uh, chewing on coca leaves. Coca leaves that are eventually, or they're used in processing to make cocaine, but in their natural form as leaves, you'd need to eat like a hay bale's worth of coca leaves to uh, register any mental or psychological effect. These are uh, freely available at the airports when you fly into like Cusco. There's a little basket and you walk up and you grab a leaf and chew on a leaf. Um, I think these are more of a placebo effect than anything. They certainly haven't been studied very well for, for the regulations around them. Very little to say that they actually lessen the symptoms of altitude, but it might simply just be a, a perceptual effect. Little that can be done on the pharmacological side. By far the best way is to uh, increase the PO2. Go down, add supplemental oxygen. Really interesting way to increase PO2 is shown here. Uh, this is a I think it's gamal bag or gamo bag. I'm not sure. But 
This is an artificially pressurized capsule to contain a symptomatic individual. There's a little foot pump. You can see this fellow over here is pumping up this bag. That's a foot pump connected to the bag. And because O2 percent at altitude isn't lower, it's the same percent oxygen. The difference was the pressure at altitude. What this does is reinstates pressure. The bag is pressurized artificially by the foot pump, but here having a higher pressure with the same concentration of oxygen increases PO2 inside the bag. And in practice, you can decrease or you can go down about 1500 meters climbing into this bag and pressurizing it with a foot pump. So without moving anywhere, without taking time to descend or fumbling with gas masks and artificial or um, supplemental oxygen, you can climb into this bag, you get a nice little window slit so you're not claustrophobic. It's pressurized, O2 gradients restored. Symptoms go down, ideally you acclimate and you can uh, climb out and you have the capacity to return down on your own or maybe continue up. But I think in a situation like this where you're climbing into a bag to pressurize and restore the PO2 gradient, you're probably doing it so that you can <clears throat> return to lower altitudes afterwards. It seems pretty dangerous to continue up after uh, this kind of treatment. Pretty elegant solution, though. Reinstating the PO2 gradient, higher pressure. Um, what else can you do at altitude? Some individuals have proposed the idea that increasing blood volume would help you at altitude, help you uh, withstand altitude or... Um, deal with low PO2. And increasing blood volume may in fact do that. Blood being plasma plus red cells. Red cells having hemoglobin being the operative oxygen carrying uh, compartment in the blood. But just expanding or sorry, expanding red cell volume is difficult. That's going to be the focus of our next section blood transfusions, EPO injections, how do you expand red cell volume, takes a long time. Expanding plasma volume, not as difficult. Plasma volume is, is the fluid in which red cells are carried. It's the fluid portion of blood. And so maybe expanding plasma volume artificially increases blood volume Maybe it can help sustain cardiac output. Probably wouldn't expect much effect on oxygen carrying. Plasma doesn't carry a lot of oxygen. But what if it would work at altitude? This is a representation of what those effects would be. Sea level, VO2 max over here on the left-hand side. We have a control group and a group that is plasma volume expanded. And I this is either infusion of saline or another way that you can expand plasma volume is to um, ingest glycerol with large volumes of water and glycerol goes into the blood and pulls water along with it to expand the plasma component. I can't remember which one this is but it's one of those two. It's um, expansion by water or expansion by saline water ingestion or saline infusion. But either way, when moving to high altitude, we see this marked decrease in VO2 max. We saw this already. VO2 max is decreased. The workload dictates the same VO2 max, but the total capacity is lower. And it's lower to a similar degree in both groups. There's no protection afforded by plasma volume expansion. And then on return to sea level, on the far right-hand side, both groups return to a similar VO2 max that is uh, slightly reduced compared to baseline, but not appreciably so. No difference between groups. There's small cardiorespiratory effect of plasma volume expansion, either at altitude or at sea level. 
depending on how you want to frame this, if you're the authors, they might argue that this is a somewhat increased VO2 max on the order of two mils per kilogram per minute. And maybe that's statistical. What that means, I'm not really sure. Two mils per kilogram per minute is pretty small. Um, it might help alleviate cardiac output stress. We saw cardiac output was similarly limited at altitude. And with a higher blood volume, cardiac output isn't stressed as much. Maybe that's how we eke out that last mil per kilogram per minute. But functionally, no major effect of plasma volume expansion. By far, though, supplemental oxygen is the way to go for successful ascent and as a countermeasure at altitude. Um, the, the reason that it wasn't so successful initially was the use of closed circuit spirometry. And the difference between these two is um, closed circuit supplies all of the air required. And you recycle the expired air through a CO2 scrubber and rebreathe it. So a closed circuit uh, spirometry set is completely contained you're breathing from an oxygen canister back through a CO2 scrubber into a different canister and then rebreathing that air. So it's all self-contained. If anything goes wrong, you are out of luck. Generally, they're heavier as well and more complicated. Uh, open circuit spirometry is not unlike the metabolic carts that we have where you're breathing air in. It's just room air going in that's being supplemented by oxygen. So you're breathing air in, it's supplemented by oxygen in a canister, and then you're expelling air to the environment. You're not rebreathing it, you don't need the CO2 scrubbers, you don't need pressure or uh, as many pressure regulators um, because you're not rebreathing that air, and it's generally lighter and a bit more reliable. Both of them increase oxygen delivery. Make a higher PO2 environment through increasing the delivery of oxygen. And we can look at what that looks like in these uh, small little clips. Hold on. There we go. Bondilla Legends use the closed circuit equipment. This was more complicated and less reliable gave oxygen at above sea level pressure. Their oxygen consumption was two and a quarter liters a minute above the coal, and they climbed the first 1,500 feet above the coal at 900 feet an hour, an alpine performance for these conditions. In 1952, Lambert and Tensing, without oxygen, had managed only 250 feet per hour over the same ground. When Bordillon and Evans got back to the car, having climbed 3,000 feet in a day, they were profoundly exhausted. The effects of going off oxygen were interesting. Sudden failure caused temporary breathlessness and in two cases incontinence. Slow failure was apt to pass unnoticed. No symptoms were noticed if the climber rested before taking his set off. Experimentally, oxygen caused a large drop in ventilation and rise in CO2 tension during exercise, but little change at rest. So what you saw in that video were the closed circuit sets. And Bordillon and Evans were the first pair to try to ascend Everest. And they failed because of the equipment. They turned back within 80 meters of the summit because their tanks ran out. Or their tanks ran out that they were using, and then the other ones froze. So they had to leave the tanks there and return back down. But you heard of them, or you heard mention of them um, climbing 900 feet an hour compared to the second attempt on the next day, which is Hillary and Tenzing, who we know were the first to summit Everest. They climbed 250 feet per hour, so a quarter of the pace. The path was already cut for them by these first two guys through the snow up the mountain, so they didn't have to cut a path. 
and they were using open circuit sets, so lighter. And when they got to 80 meters below the summit, they could um, they they took some equipment to thaw the canisters out, and they used the leftover tanks, and that's the only reason they were successful. So we we know their names as the first two individuals to summit Everest, not the first attempt, and not the uh, the not the performance you would expect. I mean, it's certainly a feat to uh, to climb Mount Everest, but uh, a fraction of the performance that these two fellows were uh, were exhibiting just the day before. So I didn't include these uh, this in the notes just because it's fairly wordy, but it uh, it gives a bit of a sense of how the equipment was tested, and this is a, a write up by. Um, Griffith Pugh on his tests of the closed versus open circuit sets. And um, you can see here the effect of the extra weight of the equipment slows your time by 25%. The increased effect of breathing oxygen accelerates the time by 10%. There's little difference between a faster and a slower flow rate. But overall, the open circuit equipment, which only weighs 22 pounds, pales in comparison to the 50 pounds of the closed circuit sets. So this is magnified with the closed circuit sets. It's minimized with the open circuit sets. And um, their testing allowed them to, to say, OK, this one's less heavy. We don't need as many regulators. It's easier to use. Um, open circuit is, is the preferential choice. And I think, I think there's actually, oh yeah, there's a bit more about it. Hold on, here. It's probably a bit more information than I can do. Been taken on every expedition to Everest. But before 1952, mountaineers were not convinced of its value for their purpose. This is the 1922 set. The flow rates of oxygen were too small, and an efficient method of applying it had yet to be developed. The 1953 set was based on RAF open circuit equipment. It had light alloy cylinders, an economizer, that is a spring-loaded bag emptying in inspiration, and a specially modified mask which kept respiratory pressures down to acceptable levels, even at minute volumes of 100 liters a minute. Although this set weighed the same as the early sets, it gave twice as much oxygen a six-hour supply at four liters a minute with alternative flow rates of two to six liters. Work on the training expedition had shown that much more oxygen would be needed than had been taken before, and 190,000 liters were taken, four times as much as on any previous expedition. Some closed circuit sets were also taken for trial. Oxygen was used on the assault for climbing and sleeping all the way from 22,000 feet. Oxygen at night was vitally important. Climbers now feel that they could climb 28,000 foot peaks without extra oxygen if only they can have it for sleeping. Without oxygen for sleeping, there is little recovery from fatigue at this altitude. Right, so you can see the difference between the sets and a pretty radical shift from the, uh, the, par <coughs> the paradigm earlier where you don't need oxygen, just be tough and climb a mountain. Um, the, uh, the sleep architecture is really in interesting. This has been monitored in the lab. And you can see with, with uh, hypoxia, this is ventilation. And these rapid spikes of hyperventilation when you're at altitude with um, that are interspersed with these these periods of not breathing we call it Shane Stokes breathing so it's very uh, disruptive it's not restful and can be completely alleviated by like we saw in the video adding supplemental oxygen much nicer even undulations and tidal volume the uh, the spots where these drop off is due to the sensor it's not that the lungs completely empty or the, the SAO2 is completely lower. But the um, breathing is a lot more smooth when using oxygen during, uh, during the night as well to, to limit these disruptions.
Um, not a lot of information on that, though. I just thought it was kind of interesting to know. So, in the extreme sense, at the most extreme high altitude, or at any altitude, the complication of moving to altitude and performing is low PO2. Low PO2 limits the PO2 gradient. Low PO2 limits oxygen transport. Low PO2 results in reduced saturation. And so while that crisis is being experienced, the body tries to rectify it by increasing ventilation, by hyperventilating, by vasoconstricting in an attempt to restore low saturation. But ultimately, even with acclimation, even with these countermeasures, VO2 and cardiac output are lower because of the lower environmental PO2. The partial pressure of oxygen limits the functional ability in nature at altitude. So acutely ventilation and vasoconstriction try to rectify it. Now, if we allow ourselves time to acclimate, we can't do anything about the low PO2. So the way around dealing with that uh, constantly low PO2 is to increase carrying capacity, increase the amount of oxygen that can be extracted from the air or stored in the body because the gradient can't be changed. Increasing carrying capacity means proliferating red blood cells and increasing hemoglobin content. Perhaps, unfortunately, the efficiency of delivery to the tissues improves through a, a decrease in fiber size. We saw the capillary to fiber size ratio, which sounds good on paper. We increase delivery of oxygen and the, the um, distribution of oxygen to the tissues is improved, but the tissue itself suffers. The tissue itself is smaller, limiting performance um, or force generation and fatigability at the muscle. We also tend to switch to carbohydrate for various reasons. We think HIF-1 is a switch. We don't know why that's necessarily better or worse. <clears throat> Excuse me. Certainly fat has much more energy, but absorption is limited. So we have better ability to absorb carbohydrate and we end up switching to it at altitude if we spend enough time <laughs> at altitude. Now those describe the changes for uh, lowlanders that live or lowlanders that move up. But what I'll call long-term adaptations, those of the Sherpas or peoples that live at altitude regularly, is similar but taken to the extreme. They try to minimize energy-consuming processes. So they they increase lung volume to limit the amount of activation that the respiratory muscles need to do. They still decrease fiber size. It doesn't cost as much energy to keep up those large muscles and those large tissues. But they emphasize loading of the blood and transport of oxygen. They don't have as much hemoglobin. It doesn't take as much energy to, to keep up all of that extra hemoglobin. Instead, it seems like they have a different kind of hemoglobin that is better able to transport oxygen. At least in some high altitude populations, and it differs depending on what population you look at, but the population that we examined exhibited similar, if not slightly lower, hematocrits than adapted lowlanders. Which is really interesting, suggesting that that's not the bottleneck. Overall, whether you're successful at altitude seems to be limited by the individual physiology of the climber. Individual physiology being, are they susceptible to mountain sickness? Are they susceptible to changes in uh, edema and the accumulation of fluid in the lungs or the brain? Are they driven irrationally by um, the need to summit 
Are they able, with their support staff, with the structure of the expedition, to get adequate food and fluid? Um, do they have a good proportion of muscle fibers? Are they um, largely oxidative and not fatigable? Do they have naturally high ventilation rates? Are they sensitive to changes in um, PO2 and PCO2? So that summarizes a lot of different aspects that we talked about, but mainly that one, um, what makes a climber slide that we talked about earlier on last week. So let's uh, take a quick break.